Discord right now. So everyone should see the little recording sign up in the corner. Um, and just so for the ease of the video and those sort of things, once, uh, once I pass it over to Miranda, if you want to just um, turn the camera off on your side so that um, you're not recorded and it just makes the video a bit, uh, bit easier to watch, that'd be great. Um, and then, of course, once the discussion starts after the presentation, then we will uh, invite you to turn your camera back on um, and uh, so we can see you uh, at, or feel free not to turn it back on and, and participate in the discussion afterward. Um, and just a heads up that the discussion won't be recorded. Um, and so if we start the discussion, this is for myself again, but if we start the discussion and you still see the recording sign going, uh, then just let me know and I'll stop recording the session. So anyone, if uh, you're just joining, um, we're just going to get started here. And if anyone joins a bit late, um, then the recording will be available and they can catch up um, afterward. And so the way that it's essentially going to work is I'll do a bit of a, a quick introduction to our two panelists, uh, Miranda and Kelly here on the line. Um, and then uh, Miranda will take it away with the presentation. And then once the presentation is done, we will switch to a bit more of a question and answer discussion period um, for the second half of the session. And uh, you'll be able to participate either uh, by asking a question yourself, so you can unmute your camera um, and audio when, if you wanted to ask a question, or you can put it in the chat box on the bottom. Um, and uh, Kelly just posted a message, so if everyone can see the, the chat, you can post your question there, um, and then I will make sure that it's asked. Um, or you can also, if your your camera is muted and you wanted to post it, but you can't really like raise your hand in the video, you can also put in the chat that you'd like to speak, and I'll uh, I'll make sure we pass the floor over to you at that time. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we have a few different uh, groups on the call, you know, academics and non-academics and students and, and faculty. So it's, it's a great mix of everyone that's here. Um, I know we're really excited to be giving uh, this chat today and, and um, looking forward to sharing that uh, a bit of a virtual space with everyone. Given the, you know, uncertain times we're going through, it's, it's great to still be able to share some thoughts and, and research and things that's going on. Um, and and try and find a bit of normalcy in all of this. So I appreciate everyone for participating and for joining in. Um, so the webinar today is Philanthropy in Newfoundland, Supporting Environmental Charities and Nonprofits. Uh, if you wanna switch the slide, Miranda. We have two panelists here today, um, and then I'll be uh, the, the moderator. So I'll just give a, a bit of an introduction to myself first is, uh, my name is Brady Reed. I know um, quite a few of you on the call already, uh, but if you don't know me, I'm a graduate student at the University of Guelph, uh, but also living and from Newfoundland. Um, so I'm based here now and doing a bit of work here uh, with, uh, with Kelly and with Brentville Campus. And so uh, I'll be sort of the moderator if you have any questions or if you're in the chat um, talking back and forth, I'll be the one who's sort of moderating that. And we have uh, Dr. Kelly Vaden on the call. I was a professor with the Environmental Policy Institute and Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies at Grenfell Campus, who's been engaged in community and regional development research, policy, and practice in Canadian rural communities across the country for more than 25 years. And the lead of the uh, webinar today is Miranda Ivany, a graduate student at the University of Guelph, pursuing her MSc in Rural Planning and Development. Um, her research seeks to understand the challenges of and potential for rural environmental charitable organizations to contribute to the community and environmental resiliency. So another, a, a bit more about me, I guess I'm, I'm also uh, the coordinator of uh, the Fee Lab, um, which is one of the uh, many partners of this project and, and supporting um, the research that's going on. So the Fee Lab uh, is a, a national research network of philanthropic organizations um, across the country that's supported by SHRC, uh, SHRC um, Partnership uh, Development Grant. Um, and we are one of the hubs of that in Atlantic Canada, um, joined by other hubs in Quebec, Ontario, and, and Western Canada. And so we represent um, sort of a smaller portion of research going on, um, and, and some of the funding is going towards this project and supporting uh, the environmental charities and organizations. So the Fee Lab questions, what we ask is looking at the impacts of foundations on major societal, societal issues, relationships to and implications for public policy and how research can support small and medium-sized grant-making foundations. So it's really about that 
network building, um, understanding the landscape of philanthropy um, and how that can really impact uh, community, de community development um, in, uh, in Atlanta, Canada, at least really looking at that rural lens um, and then nationally, how that impacts um, development across the country. And we also have another, uh, I guess, partner or, or you know, collaborator on the project through um, another SHRC funded project, uh, place-based endowments in the periphery. Um, and we have some other students uh, who are involved in that project on the call. So uh, for those on the call, if I uh, make a mistake or don't say something right, then feel free to, uh, to correct me. Um, we have uh, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Ryan Gibson, who's uh, unable to join us today, but he's the principal investigator of this project. Um, and again, is that national uh, studying philanthropic uh, organizations at the national level. Um, and this project is specifically looking at uh, rural philanthropy. So, so like looking at that urban rural divide. Uh, it's a five year project that started back in 20, uh, I believe 2017 or 2018, I'm not exactly sure, but it goes until 2020. Um, and again, it's sort of national research with three case study regions uh, in Ontario, uh, BC, and then uh, Newfoundland. <laughs> And the project is examining connections between philanthropic organizations, rural communities, and place-based endowments, including connections to place, um, and looking at the implications for local development. And so there's really that shift in um, how philanthropy can be you know, used as a, and facilitate community development um, and engagement with, uh, with rural development. So that's a bit about me and a bit about the sponsors, and, and there are many more. Um, and, uh, and I'll pass the floor over to Miranda, who will, who will start the presentation, and uh, I will see you again once the discussion begins. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're really happy to have you all here today to share what we've learned. Um, we want you to know we're still in the initial stages of our project, so we want to acknowledge that the research is still very much so a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So we welcome any comments or suggestions that you might have. And as Brady mentioned, we're going to open up um, a discussion after the presentation is done. And we would love to hear from any of the charities or nonprofits on the line uh, that would like to share their experience. Um, I also want to quickly thank Brady for so generously acting as our tech support and moderator today. Um, and I would also like to thank Philab and the Atlantic Hub, as well as the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development, where I'm doing my master's, uh, for making this research possible. I would also really like to thank IBEC, uh, the Indian Bay Ecosystem Corporation, which is on the line with us today. They are our community partner in this project. And I want to lastly thank uh, my co-advisors, Kelly and Leith, um, Kelly Vodden and Dr. Leith Beacon. Um, both of whom have been just as active in this project as I am. So today we'll go over um, a bit about the project background, then we'll get into some of the more interesting um, information that we've learned about the state of rural charities in Canada. We'll focus in a little bit on environmental philanthropy in Canada, in Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland, as well as the challenges and opportunities that we have seen. Um, we'll look at some alternatives that have come up such as partnerships and then we'll go in um, to review some of the secondary data that uh, from the CRA um, and this data has we've had a lot of help with uh, Dr. Ryan Gibson's team to collect this so we want to thank them for that um, and now I'm just going to turn off my camera as well to help the uh, make sure there's no disruptions So a bit about our project background. Um, it's been long recognized that rural charities and nonprofits make significant contributions to their local communities and to larger global societies. However, very little academic attention has examined the contribution that environmental charities make to Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland more specifically. Um, our project aims to work collaboratively with community partners and philanthropic organizations in Newfoundland and Labrador to identify the unique challenges and opportunities that exist to help increase access to resources and support for these organizations. Our project has taken a specific focus um, of looking at the state of environmental charities and nonprofits to better understand how supporting the sector can contribute to environmental and community resiliency. 
And just to keep us all on track today, I just wanted to uh, let you know what the goal of the webinar was. Um, and it's predominantly to bring people up to speed on what is happening in the landscape of philanthropy in Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada. We want to review uh, the CRA data to help create a clearer image of what's happening. Um, but most importantly, we're interested in getting any feedback on the project and hearing from um, environmental organizations in the sector as to learn how we can make this project even better and how we can support them. So jumping right into it, um, some of the more interesting things that we've come across is that in 2017, Canada's nonprofit sector generated 169.2 billion, which represented 8.5% 8 8 of Canada's gross domestic product. In Atlantic Canada, the nonprofit sector created um, contributed a greater portion to the total GDP as compared to other provinces. Um, and we also found that charitable institutions that provide healthcare and education were the most supported philanthropic sectors of all. Um, so some more information about charities. We found that there's over 18,000 that exist in rural regions across Canada. Charities, as some of you might know, are legally operating organizations that are public or private, uh, which are registered with the Canada Revenue Agency under the Income Tax Act. To be registered as a charity, organizations must dedicate all of their resources that come from charitable, their charitable sources directly to their charitable activities. So what this means is that funds that come from charitable donations must be kept separate and not used interchangeably with funds that, with other funds that the organization might have. So because of these somewhat strict requirements, we've found that some charities have opted to have their accounting and auditing requirements done separately so that there's no mix up within the processes. Also, so to be registered as a charity, an organization must provide benefits and services to the public or to a significant portion of the public as delineated by the CRA um, outline. And all charities must carry out activities which fit under one of the following broad categories you can see under the screen. So they either have to fit under the relief of poverty, the advancement of education, the advancement of religion, or for other purposes beneficial to the public. We can see that these are quite broad and um, an organization might fit into a number of these things. <clears throat> I'm just going to go back for a second. Um, although we, a lot of what we have and what we'll share with you today looks at the high level state of philanthropy, um, in the following months we hope to create uh, resources and document the exact requirements for gaining charitable status to help those organizations who are considering going through this process. So moving on. Um, throughout our research thus far, we found that individuals that individual philanthropic behavior is more frequently driven by the desire of individuals to support the causes they care about. And it was, and less emphasis was placed on any sort of financial benefits that an individual might receive. However, in 2012, a study completed by Hussein and Lam, um, it was found that when surveyed, Canadians acknowledged that they would be more likely to donate to environmental causes if government tax incentives were increased. So the study argued that policies which maintain the same tax rate deductions across all charitable sectors in Canada ultimately uh, may ultimately have a negative implication for the growth of environmental giving across Canada. This is likely because it's so ingrained for individuals and corporations to donate to charities that focus on um, issues such as health or education and also potentially that environmental causes tend to be a little more political, that it might make them less likely to break away from what they're used to. So we see uh, there might be this potential if there wasn't this uniformity in tax rate deductions, that there may be an increase in environmental charitable giving. So digging down a little deeper, um, Environmental philanthropy is defined as 
the provision of time, money, or gifts to mitigate environmental issues. And in a 2012 study by Greenspan et al., uh, it describes environmental philanthropy as just one type of environmentally conscious behavior, which is enacted by individuals, communities, and organizations. This study found that um, there were, or identified several underlying factors that contribute to the likelihood of whether or not someone might give to an environmental cause. And they identified that uh, an individual's or community's value orientation played a large role, their political orientation, their relative level of environmental knowledge, um, as well as their gender, their ethnic origin, and their academic status played a big part in whether or not they were likely to give. So um, this graph here shows the distributions of environmental grants across Canada. It was completed, uh, it was a in a report completed by the Canadian Environmental Grant Makers Network in 2016. Um, the diagram shows, um, the, you can see the percentages on the bottom of provinces and how many grants were given to each. So we can see that within the environmental charitable sector that there's a fairly disproportionate distribution of funding uh, for organizations across Canada. And the teal color represents BC and the gray color you can see on your slide represents Ontario and that makes up 75% of all environmental grants. If we start looking at the smaller, barely visible lines, um, we can see that in Atlantic, that Atlantic Canada only received 2.5% of all grants. Um, and this raises a number of questions for our research, such as whether or not the distribution is a result of there being so few environmental uh, charities in Atlantic Canada to receive these grants, or whether it's an indication of charitable organizations in other re regions receiving more support uh, because they're preferred. It's likely that the data is influenced by the relatively low number of environmental organizations in Atlantic Canada, but this is something that um, we will be exploring in our research. So in the same study, um, they also reviewed what the top five funded environmental issues across Canada were. And the first uh, on the left of your screen, I believe, um, shows that biodiversity, biodiversity and species protection was the top funded issue. And the second was coastal and marine ecosystems with uh, freshwater ecosystems following closely behind. And the fourth was terrestrial ecosystems and land use. And then the fifth most funded, um, or the top fifth top funded environmental issue was anything to do with energy. If we look to the right of your screen now, we can also see that um, the CEGN reviewed what the top five funded strategies employed by environmental charities were. And the most funded strategy was direct activity, with um, and then there was anything to do with education and youth organizing. Um, the third was research. The fourth was public education and awareness. And the fifth was capacity building. So as we have examined the literature on this topic, a number of ch challenges have become very apparent. Uh, one of which is that small and rural charities in Atlantic Canada often struggle to reach a wide audience, uh, which makes it increasingly difficult for these organizations to secure funding. In a 2008 CRE report, I found that a major struggle uh, identified by small and rural charities was associated with their limited internal capacity. So limited internal capacity was described as including, but wasn't limited to their time, their resources, their volunteers, and their staff available. They identified that with fewer paid staff members on hand, it significantly contributed to difficulties related to the initiation and completion of projects, as well as, the pro uh, as well as in the process of searching for and securing funding. It made it even more difficult. Um, sorry, my computer internet seems to be going a little bit. Um, so it was, 
that the challenges associated with limited capacity made it even more difficult for organizations to find the time and resources to uh, be more innovative. Organizations that address struggling with a limited capacity also acknowledged how this made it even more difficult for them to maintain the strong social networks that they believed they needed to be supported and successful. Um, and for the causes that they champion to reach a wider audience. Another challenge that was addressed was, um, was that there's been an increased occurrence that available grants um, have more conditions attached to them, which prioritize charitable activities that fill uh, service provision gaps, so such as the requirement to build infrastructure. So some small and rural charities in the study um, highlighted that with the more conditions attached to these grants, they felt like they had less time to focus their attention on future innovative initiatives and that, that they might want to take on. <clears throat> so although there are a number of challenges that have been identified, um, there's still some more optimistic opportunities that exist. Um, one of which is that Canadians in general are very charitable, and Newfoundlanders especially. It was found uh, that 92% of Newfoundland's population engaged in charitable giving in 2010, uh, and that 87 engaged in charitable giving in 2013. When compared to other provinces and territories, Newfoundland also had the high, um, Newfoundland had the highest charitable donor rate in all of Canada. Um, as well, Newfoundlanders were found to have the highest sense of belonging to both their province and to their local communities. Another opportunity that sets rural charities apart from their urban counterparts is that they're well positioned to identify local needs and priorities within their own regions. They're more likely to understand the complexity of issues that they're dealing with and to be able to provide good insight into how these issues can be addressed in a meaningful way. For this project, uh, we're interested in understanding this intersection of these facts to better conceptualize how it can be pot potentially used to harness community support for charitable organizations. A question that we're exploring is whether or not smaller donations have a more significant impact in rural areas as opposed to urban areas. Uh, so what we mean by this is that, like how far, uh, even though, in the same study that looked at charitable giving rates, it highlighted that the amounts given by each individual in Newfoundland was lower than in other provinces, but we're interested in seeing how far smaller donations go in rural areas where the amount of money might not need to be as high. Um, but this is something that we'll look into as our research moves forward. So a study by Jamie Gamble in 2014 looked at a number of the underlying factors that contribute to low environmental giving. And he expanded on that by providing potential ways to increase environmental giving in Atlantic Canada. He suggested that some of the most important means of achieving this was through the increased collaboration and knowledge sharing between charities of all sizes. Um, by increasing collaboration, charities were able to more effectively and efficiently amplify the work that they're doing so that it can reach a wider audience. Additionally, he suggested that in response, many environmental charities in Atlantic Canada tend to focus uh, uh, solely on local issues um, and that there is this need for them to collaboratively work together to broaden the environmental narratives that exist. So by broadening environmental narratives, he argues that it will help audiences to more easily understand how environmental issue, that the environmental issues they're dealing with don't only address environmental causes, but how they're linked to other important sectors such as health and the economy. It was highlighted that through the creation of an active and supportive network that rural charities will be able to harness greater collective power to manage environmental issues while simultaneously increasing funding opportunities in the environmental sector. And although this might seem a little beyond the capacity of what some charities in Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada are currently able to do, 
it speaks to some of the underlying actions that environmental charities um, in these regions can begin to incorporate in into their objectives as a way to strengthen the sector as a whole. And by working together, this will help to increase environmental giving in, the, in these regions. So one of the interesting things that we came across was um, the emergence of partnerships and how this was an alternative to some charities in small or in rural areas that weren't necessarily able to or weren't didn't necessarily want to obtain a charitable status. Um, so a 2017 study examined the presence of charity non charity partnerships. Uh, finding that these kinds of alternatives arose from the need to adapt to decreased funding for the sector, an increased need for responsiveness, and a high number of charitable organizations that were being deregistered. Uh, the literature suggests that due to increased costs associated with registering and maintaining a charitable designation, that partnerships have emerged more organically as a way of sharing resources and lessening individual burdens. So there's several models that ex um, that have been studied, which range from little interaction between partners to the complete integration of the non-charity into the charities uh, into the charity. And although there may be many benefits to these alternatives, they require a high degree of trust and collaboration between partners that engage in them. And this may or may not be. Um, something that some charities are able to do. So I'm just gonna briefly go over the models that were um, studied. Uh, so these include, these include, uh, the models that were identified include the conduit model, the technical assistance model, the platform model, and the subsidiary model. So in the conduit model, there um, is little interaction between partners with funds being simply transferred uh, from the charity to the non-charity. In the technical assistance model, there is a greater interaction between partners where the charity provides services, advice, and oversight to the non-charity, as well as the transfer of funds through accounts that have been set up in the non-charity's name. Um, and in this, in, in this model, both partners remain as separate legal entities. In the platform model, we see that um, a very similar relationship develops between partners as in the technical assistance model. Um, however, in this model, there's this partial integration of the non-charity, of any non-charities uh, that are not legal entities into the charities organization. Into, uh, sorry, in the subsidiary model, there we see the complete integration of the non-charity um, where the provision of supports and services are shared between partners. In this model, both partners work collaboratively in oversight committees and the charity maintains the right to make any final decisions. Um, in all of these models, the charity also maintains the right to make any final decisions. So moving forward, we're gonna go into some of the um, Canada Revenue Agency data that uh, Dr. Ryan Gibson's team helped us collect. Um, so in this first, and we're just hoping to create a clearer image of the state of charitable organizations in Newfoundland and Atlanta, Canada for all of this. Looking at the graphs on your slide, we can see that the, ch the number of charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland have remained fairly steady over time um, and they're only was a small drop in the number of charities registered in 2017. The data from 2017 uh, onwards has not become available yet. So as it does, we will adjust these graphs and track any changes that occur. So the graphs on the slide show the breakdown of charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland based on their location and geography. Uh, for this analysis, we've used the definitions of census agglomeration, census metropolitan areas, and rural and small towns to define um, 
whether a location is more or less urban or rural. So just a brief um, description of these. Uh, so a CMA is defined as having an urban core population of 50,000 or more with a total population of 100,000 or more. And CAAs have an urban core population of 10,000 with a total population of less than 100,000. Both CMAs and CAs include the population of neighboring incorporated towns and municipalities where more than 50% of the labor, few, labor force commutes in. Rural and small town areas uh, refer to non-CMA CA areas and RST areas are further divided into zones which are used to describe essentially the level uh, of a location's rurality. Um, so if we go back to the graphs on this slide, we can look, uh, we can see that it highlights in Atlantic Canada, 50% of the charities are located in rural small town locations, while in Newfoundland, the percentage is slightly higher than half of charities being located in RST regions. So this slide here uh, looks at the revenue um, received by charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland. Um, it indicates that a majority of charities in Atlantic Canada range in revenue size between 10,000 to 100,000 and 100,000 to a million. You can see when you look to the right of your screen that this is also true for Newfoundland. However, more broadly, the percent of charities in Newfoundland with a revenue between 100,000 and a million um, is significantly higher. And you can see at the bottom of the screen uh, in the little, um, it provides the percentages of charities which are in each category. Moving on, we took the information from the previous slide and uh, added an additional layer of analysis to see the revenue sizes uh, based on the charity's location. So between whether it was in a CA, CMA, and rural small town. So we found that for each category, the revenues of charities in RST locations were either significantly higher uh, than the other two geographies or on par. We can also see that a significant portion of charities with the revenues between 10,000 and up to 100,000 and 100,000 to a million were mostly located or were located in rural small town areas. Um, so another thing that we looked at was what the gift sizes were for each, um, for charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland. Um, and we can see that in Atlantic Canada, 50% of charities received gifts that were either under 10,000 and that another, that the other 50% of charities received gifts that were 10,000 and over. In Newfoundland, we can see that although the data is fairly similar, 60% um, of charities received gifts that were over 10,000. And just drilling down a little bit more in the gift size uh, for Newfoundland, for some of you on the line, um, we can see that uh, the gift sizes for charities in Newfoundland, um, that most categories for RST locations either received the most in each gift category or they were on par with other locations. So it's quite interesting to see that um, the majority of charities located in RST regions were between um, the gift size category, or the gift size categories of 10,000 to 100,000 and 100,000 to a million. So when we look at this slide here, it breaks down charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland based on their designation. So what um, the labels on the bottom here are looking at is whether a charity is a public foundation, a private foundation, or a charitable uh, organization. And private and public foundations aren't inherently charitable. So this is um, 
what this depicts here. Uh, there's a lot of differences in these categories. So this is just a broad generalization of what's happening. But if we look at this, we can see that um, the majority of charities in both Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland are designated as a charitable organization. And then moving on, kind of building off that last graph, um, this graph depicts the differences between public, private, and charitable organizations that give to qualified donees. So a qualified donee um, was described as an organization that can af um, issue official donation receipts for gifts they receive from individuals or corporations. Examples of qualified donees include but aren't limited to a registered charity, a registered athletic association, a Canadian mu municipality, or a university. And although the graphs depict that the majority of charities um, do not give to qualified donees, we can see that, that more charitable organizations in Newfoundland give to qualified donees when compared to other um, charities across Atlanta, Canada. So you can kind of see the difference in the area that's projected um, in the blue. Um, and you can see that 41% of charitable organizations in Newfoundland give to qualified donees, while roughly only 35% of charitable organizations give to qualified donees in Atlantic Canada. And the, the amounts for public and private are fairly similar um, between the two regions, or between Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland. So some of the lessons that we've learned um, is that um, when we started going through this, we, we went through a directory of charities in Newfoundland, uh, which included over 1,400. And we found that there's a relatively small number of charities that exclusively carry out environmental work. Um, and and additionally, there is a variety of category codes that organizations can choose from to, to define the work that they do. And when we were looking through this, um, there was specific, uh, each charity that we had kind of identified as doing some sort of environmental work used a number of different codes. So there was a lack of consistency. Um, However, this is something that we are also looking into more, um, more as this research goes forward. We're identifying charities that do environmental work. Um, and it's a little more tricky in Newfoundland as opposed to some of the other regions because there's a relatively low number. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to limit our search. Um, so we're trying to identify any organization that does something that contributes to the environmental sector. Um, the charitable organizations uh, that, so this kind of highlights the lack of appropriate um, categories that are available to accurately and appropriately categorize environmental charitable work in Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland, but across Canada as well. Um, and, while, um, and some of the charitable organizations that we're able to identify include, um, their work includes a combination of things from environmental education to environmental networking or direct preservation and conservation. And while over half of the charities in general located in Newfoundland were found in rural and small town locations, most of the environmental charities that we were, or charitable organizations that we were able to identify were predominantly located in densely populated regions like St. John's. Um, so this is something that we will look into more so. <laughs> so um, just kind of review where we are, what we want to do. Um, so we're going to, our next step is to go back to that CRE data, identify charitable organizations um, that do environmental work in both Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada, and try to see some of those differences in their gift sizes, their revenue sizes, um, 
to see what's happening more specifically in that sector. Um, and then we'll move forward with um, interviews for this uh, project. And we hope to gain some insights from environmental charities and nonprofits into their challenges, barriers, and potential benefits of obtaining a charitable designation so that we can better support them and see what's happening. Um, and then we hope to develop and distribute resources that help to better support environmental charities and nonprofits. So now I'm going to pass things back to Brady and we'll stop the recording. Oh, sorry, before I finish, this is uh, just a small ref uh, list of references. And if anyone on the line was interested in knowing more about them, you are welcome to contact me. My contact information will be at the, on the last slide. It is also available in some of the emails that were sent to you. And I would be more than happy to, to share our resources with you. But now I will pass it back to Brady and we can open up the discussion portion and turn off the, uh, turn off the recording. Great. So let me see if I can 